name is Margot Wallström and I'm the Vice President of the European Commission. It's difficult to sort of summarize in, from that point of view. I think the disappointment was, of course, that we had an even lower voter turnout uh, in these elections than, than last time. But, that, but it was a very uneven result, because in as much as 11 countries, actually the voter turnout was higher. But in general, it went down further, even if it was not as much as predicted. I think what was positive was that in those countries and those parties where they tried to introduce a more pan-European perspective and debate, where they focused on substance issues, then voters actually uh, rewarded them for, for doing that. So this was a, a good uh, element. Uh, there was also uh, an increase, or we saw um, some really extremist and right-wing candidates being uh, voted into the European Parliament, and that is always sad. And uh, I think that the whole picture, it will be more volatile, it will be more difficult to find, as we've seen uh, in the last, um, during the last mandate, sort of this uh, uh, grand coali coalition, uh, big coalitions or, or big solutions uh, uh, between uh, the, the political groups. Uh, so I think that um, it, it will be a tougher um, five years to come for, for the Commission also to find the support and backing of the different proposals. I think when, when the sort of established mainstream uh, political parties do not integrate the European issues into their normal political debate and, and discussion and discourse, then it is easy, or if people don't see that they address the, the real problems, then there will always be room for, for the extremists uh, or the populists. And I, I think that you will very often see also as a result of a deep economic crisis that this can be the result. If people think that the politicians are not doing enough, uh, they will be more inclined to listen to, to those that have a very, very clear or simplistic uh, message, unfortunately. So um, I think that there, there are many uh, explanations to why this, uh, this happens. But I, I think the lack of a truly European public space where you can discuss these issues, where it is a natural part of the political uh, discussion, um, that is, that is uh, definitely one of the explanations. The fact is that um, the Irish, um, who are yet to um, um, ratify the new treaty, um, they um, uh, have announced that they are willing to, to have another uh, referendum and probably uh, the 2nd of, of October or beginning of October. And um, the, it has been a long winding road um, to have a new a decision on a new treaty for the European Union. And this is because it has to be ratified by all 27 member states. And um, the background is, of course, that we could see that the, the, the rule book, the existing treaties, they are not designed to host 27 member states. They are not um, uh, effective or democratic or... Um, well designed enough to live up to, to the demands of, uh, of the times we live in. And we want to make sure that we can speak with one voice on the international scene, for example. Uh, we want to make sure that we can take decisions much more effectively. And we want to make sure that we are more democratic, inviting citizens, for example, to take initiatives. And, and there are new provisions of that kind. Um, uh, in, in the, the treaty. But um, we've had problems in, in uh, a few countries where through referenda people have, have um, opposed it and uh, it has not been very well sort of communicated in, in, uh, uh, in those countries. We already have an established um, ne negotiation <coughs> cycle and negotiations are, are going on already with uh, a number of 
<coughs> of, of countries, um, Croatia being sort of first on, on the list, with newcomers like Iceland mm, that um, has already um, decided that they would uh, apply for, for membership um, in, in the parliament. Um, and uh, of course Turkey, uh, and that is since many, many years now that we are uh, engaged in a negotiation procedure also with Turkey. So there, there is already, and of course we hope that the countries in, in the Balkan area will become uh, new members. It, it helps if we have sort of a modern, effective treaty uh, on how to take decisions also when we are so that many member states. Uh, even though it is not an absolute uh, sort of uh, uh, precondition or, or an obstacle to uh, continue. But the rules are, you know, not clear about what will happen then. I think it is part of, of, of debate where in some member states the public opinion is, is very negative and for many different reasons. I think that there is a lot of I would call it ignorance, and I mean on both sides. We are ignorant about exactly what modern Turkey looks like. I think in Turkey they are also, uh, there is a lot of ignorance about what, what it would mean and what happens and how the debate goes in, in Europe. I think that there are a lot of prejudice um, about, uh, about each other, uh, also on, on both sides. And I think there are, and clearly there are differences um, that has to be uh, sorted out and, and there, there are provisions that have to and conditions that ha they have to live up to before they can become members. And this is clearly uh, the same rules for any country. They have to live up to certain criteria about uh, defending human rights or the judicial system, how that works, etc., democratic rules. And, and still they have... Uh, quite some work to do, but I am the w one among those who think that this is one of the most important decisions that we can take, and I'm, I'm all for it. I'm really hoping that we will be able to say welcome to Turkey as a new member of the European Union. From a geopolitical point of view, there is no more important de decisions we can make, decision we can make. And I, I think also in order to secure a secular democratic development in Turkey, uh, it's so important that we live up to our commitments and that they also do the work they have to do in order to be ready. I believe it is the European Union with um, including the Balkan countries mm -hmm. uh, and I'm hoping that Turkey will also be a member. I hope that it will be uh, a European Union that will have sustainable development as the overall target and will be the, the showcase to the rest of the world that it is possible to combine economic growth by environment, with environmental protection and social uh, justice and social protection as well for, for our citizens. Um, to show that it is possible to create smart green growth and um, I hope that it will be a European Union that does the right things, takes the right decisions, but also does it right. That is, um, opens up for, for citizens and, and works on um, the, the democratic development in the different member states. Uh, and um, I think we have all the, all the possibilities uh, in the world. To, um, to make to turn Europe into a place where sustainable development is highest up on the agenda. Well, actually, we managed to increase the um, the uh, women uh, representation in the parliament, so it went up with uh, four percent. So at least that was a positive sign. But you know, women make up fifty two percent of the population of Europe but they are only represented to 30 percent um, as members of the European Parliament. That is too low. And, and even if it went up to 34 percent, this is still uh, uh, so bad. And you can see, it, as I often say, you can see it in these uh, so-called family photos from the, the summit meetings. Um, and it's all black suits and, and ties. Um, sometimes, of course, you see Angela Merkel or Tarja Hallon and the Finnish president, but uh, 
it, it is really uh, something that I don't think will, will make women very uh, motivated or, or interested. Maybe angry, which could be a good thing if, you, if they mobilize that, that sort of anger to say, well, we really have to get into, into politics, we have to change this situation. Okay. It means also that the issues that women care for and the problems that women have, including um, uh, discrimination, pure discrimination when it comes to the big wage gap still existing, or violence against women, or uh, a number of other issues, uh, they are not addressed properly. So we cannot trust that, that sort of men, a majority of men, will put this on the agenda. So I think it is so important to change. And I was engaged in, in a debate called 50-50 Democracy. EU, which uh, was a way to, to help to mobilize interest in, in uh, changing women's representation. I guess we all feel that the clock is ticking and, and that this might be sort of the last chance we have to, to actually get a global deal that will help to, to rescue life on this planet as, as we know it. And, um, this is how serious it is. Um, the biggest challenge for all decision makers everywhere is to have and to apply such a long-term thinking that is necessary to address the problem of climate change. Because we are discussing one, two, maybe three generations. We have to think about 50 years ahead. Ten years is a very long time in politics. Uh, so what about having to think about 50 years? And um, at the same time, there are some positive signs. I think that the new signals from the Obama administration, the way we've started to work together, uh, even the fact that the G8 meeting now set a target of uh, keeping the increase of the temperature uh, to two degrees above pre-industrial levels um, is a good thing because at least we've, we've decided this is the overall target and then we have to start to count backwards. How do we reach that? What, what is necessary to do? Um, and the, um, the big challenge will be to make sure that we can have, in the richer part of the world, we can have comparable emission reduction targets and that we can also get the poorest p uh, countries on board and for them also to make commitments because they are already the biggest emitters. So we have to have them at the same ta table. We have to get them on board. And to be able to do so, we have to raise the money necessary to help uh, for both adaptation and mitigation measures. Well, they, as I said, they already know that this is not something theoretic that will theoretically happen one day in the future. They know that this is already a fact. This is happening to them. There are already 300,000 people uh, dying every year from the effects of climate change. So it is already happening. They know it. Uh, but they also want to see that money is raised or resources are, are found um, so that they can uh, adapt their economies, their agriculture, their infrastructure, all of the things that are necessary to both adapt and to, to, to mitigate uh, or to invest in new um, sort of more energy efficient technology. This is where we have to, to be able to, to assist. And I just think they, they want to see that we are willing to move first, that we are, will take our responsibility and that we're willing to help. We have calculated that um, the need for this kind of, of funding would be in the range of 175 billion euros per, per year. And I saw that Gordon Brown in a recent speech uh, estimated it to be 100 billion only to the developing countries. Um, and uh, we said in the European Commission that 175 and, and half of it would have to go to the, uh, to the poorest countries. And he said 100 billion. So I think we are fairly close in understanding that these are the, the kind of, of amounts that we are talking about in order to, to pay for, for um, adaptation and mitigation measures.
This is an important part of, um, it's called a social market economy in, in Europe, where, um, of course, um, it doesn't mean immediately that, that you are sort of uh, marginalized or, or out of everything um, if, if you lose your job, but you, you are still sort of part of, of, of society. You still have a, a social uh, security, you still have a, a place in, in society. And, and this is very important also in order to, to be able to come back soon to a situation where you can find a new job or where you can also um, help your, your family. And uh, I think this, this has always been, been sort of our part of our policy. R recently we've discussed um, what is called, the concept calls uh, flex security, meaning that there has to be fle flexibility on a labor market. You know, you have to be able to adapt to, to where the new jobs will, will come. So you might have to change jobs maybe more, more often. But you should also know that you have the support of, of, of society and from your government that you can maybe be, uh, get training so that you can find a new job or you can be equipped uh, to, to take on a new job or that you get the help to move so that you can actually find a, a job somewhere else and and that will help the economy also to uh, to work more more smoothly and i think those countries where they have applied such um, systems have been um, very successful also from an economic point of view so both the social and the economic uh, elements have to be have to complement each other We, of course, have had an opportunity to compare um, when we've been looking at uh, the car manufacturers because the crisis has hit both American car producers as well as, as European car producers. And somebody who works in a car factory in, in the United States um, and, um, and his or her conditions, if being put off, uh, laid off, or if um, somebody in, in Europe loses their, their jobs, and, and that's so, it's, it's a whole lot of difference, actually. Uh, and I think, again, it's a matter of the um, attitude towards taxes, of course, and, and um, society, and, and how you, and government, and, um, and that is very different between, <laughs> we, we diverge a lot when it comes to that. They have had, of course, the highest um, growth figures um, uh, over recent years, and a lot of investments have uh, taken place in, in the former uh, Eastern European countries. And I think just for, for one second to say that we've, of course, had this is a historical achievement that we have now 27 member states, the ones who were formerly called Eastern Europe. European countries. I mean, we divided Europe into an East and a West, and today this is no longer true. We are all around the same table to take discussions, to take decisions on, on important uh, issues. Um, and I think that's um, it's an amazing achievement by, by the European Union. So I think very soon we will no longer use the concept of an Eastern and, and a Western uh, Europe, but, but one Europe that is uh, finally whole and, and free and um, um, they have they have been very very important in uh, the European economy because uh, they've had an enormous growth potential they also have big problems now of course when we are in a crisis situation but this is where solidarity also between so-called old and new member states uh, has to come to the fore you can say that it has been um, a step change um, with the internet because never before, not even with uh, sort of printed media or television, has one individual been able to do mass communication. Because before you at least needed the medium, you needed television or access to radio. But today, through the internet, one individual can do mass communication. Uh, so it means uh, a completely different uh, scenario also communication-wise. And I think we see that today people, communication to me is a tool for strengthening democracy. We are not there to sell something. <laughs> we are, we are decision-makers, we are politicians, we are uh, elected uh, uh, 
uh, in the European Parliament, etc., in the parliaments, you, you need to make sure that communication is used to strengthen democracy, to engage better in a, in a dialogue with uh, voters and, and with citizens. And for the first time, you can do that also very, very broadly. You can invite people uh, to comment, as we did for the first time on the new chemicals legislation, REACH. And we, we had more than 7,000 responses, very detailed, very well crafted, uh, most of them. And, and it, was, um, it was amazing to see that, that when you open up that opportunity, people also, um, they want to participate. They can. They are capable of it. Uh, and they are much more demanding, of course. They want to judge by themselves. So it means a little more of difficulty also for journalists, for example, because people might actually bypass the journalists and they want to follow a debate themselves directly online or um, make, make up their own minds. He, he did it masterfully, of course. I mean, he managed to not only raise money to his campaign, but f and this time from individuals, many individuals, which made him less dependent on big donors like the oil industry or what have you. Um, uh, and but he also did it using the um, the sort of the social media to uh, organize not only send a message but sort of uh, organize events and and mobilize uh, the voters as well. So this was a way to say, well, we can meet and have a party there, or we can have a rally um, that night, or we can do um, uh, whatever. Um, um, information sharing or, or what have you. So he, he used it to the full and, and the full potential of not only sending his political message but also mobilizing people and I think this is what we can learn. And he did it through, of course, um, a simple message that uh, um, everybody could understand. Uh, I'm not sure that it would work exactly like that in, in Europe but I think we can learn from from, from this, to have a simple message that, that people can, can understand and take to their hearts. Um, so there are a number of things where we can definitely share experience and say that um, this is something we could, we could do as well. And there are also differences, the, the money being, being one. The money does not play the same role in European elections. You don't have to, to do that much of fundraising, for example to be able to, to be a candidate.